This presentation is over airway, gastric, and pulmonary ultrasound assessment. We'll be talking about the expanding role of ultrasound in clinical decision making, intervention, and management of the upper and lower airways. Ultrasound can be utilized to predict airway difficulty during induction of anesthesia, evaluate whether the stomach's empty or possesses gastric content that poses an aspiration risk, and localize the essential cricothyroid membrane prior to difficult airway management. It also confirms tracheal or esophageal intubation and facilitates localization of tracheal rings for tracheostomy. Ultrasound is an excellent diagnostic tool in intraoperative and emergency diagnosis of pneumothorax, along with enabling diagnosis and treatment of interstitial syndrome, lung consolidation, atelectasis, pleural effusion, and causes of acute breathlessness. Objectives for this presentation, we're going to discuss three different uses of airway ultrasound, hopefully higher utility uses. Um, I like to compare uh, newer technologies as tool or toy. Are you just kind of messing around with it or are you really getting some degree of utility out of it? Um, as well, we're going to describe the evaluation of airway structures with ultrasound, which is a little bit on the tricky side as far as actually being able to to determine whether or not you're going to use a McGrath or a video laryngoscope or fiber optic bronchoscopy, but there is some high yield uh, uses of ultrasound which we'll talk about as well. We're also going to talk about the utility of gastric ultrasound in anesthesia management, specifically about prandial state, uh, assessing volumes, uh, aspiration risk, this and that, along with some of the um, ASA guidelines for, uh, uh, for uh, fasting. We're going to also talk about uh, gastric volume assessment with ultrasound, not just uh, absolute volume and calculation of the volume, but also the, the type of volume that you've got, which of course uh, plays a big role as far as risk goes. We're also going to talk about three uses for pulmonary ultrasound, which is uh, lung ultrasound is becoming a very big part of our armamentarium, especially if you're doing uh, a lot of, of trauma. Um, there are also some discussion about uh, use of, of pulmonary ultrasound for um, endotracheal tube um, placement, uh, endobronchial tube placement, this and that. And finally, we're going to talk about ultrasound findings with uh, uh, some of the pathological states, including pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, lung consolidation, and pleural effusion. And uh, we're going to kind of focus a little bit on the on the uses of ultrasound in patients with COVID-19, uh, as, as it's really difficult to get a handle on COVID-19 because the CT scanner, uh, physical exam, uh, history, chest x-ray, all this in lung ultrasound all kind of goes into place as far as the evaluation of these patients. Some of the uses of airway ultrasound, um, difficulty of laryngoscopy would seem to be uh, a very high utility use of airway ultrasound in that about 4% of all uh, patients, even in the hands of an experienced provider, are an unanticipated difficult airway. And ultrasonographic uh, visualization of structures relevant to, to airway anatomy is a big part of airway ultrasound. Um, airway and endotracheal tube size, we'll talk about in a moment, um, I'm, not, I'm not real sure it has a high utility in adults, but I would think that it's got a very high utility in a, in a pediatric population, especially uh, just sticking a probe on a trachea and getting a good size uh, of the outer. Outer, outer, outer diameter of the endotracheal tube. Um, airway device placement and depth. Um, I'm not real sure if this is wandering into the toy category of utility, but uh, a lot of my colleagues have a, a, a big, put a big emphasis on airway device placement, depth, whether you're into far, uh, whether you're in the esophagus, as you can kind of see here in this panel on the right, which, you know, it would seem that you, um, you know, tubes in the esophagus. I'm not sure an experienced provider is going to get a lot of utility out of this. In fact, I, I suspect that somebody uh, realized that it was in the goose and probably just got their ultrasound device out and thought they'd make a cute little clip. Um, and this is from some of, of, of Osmond's work. Uh, laryngeal mask airway verification. Um, you know, again, um, I'm not real sure. I've got a big stock in this as far as slowing me down and interrupting the process of flow. But again, it's something that uh, you get your head around it. It may be something that you find a good bit of utility for. Percutaneous cricothyroidotomy. This is a very 
big utility item here. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if you've ever done a, a, a crack. I have, I never have, but it would seem it'd be very nice to know if you had an anticipated difficult airway exactly where to stick the needle and where to start doing the trach, especially if you are doing some ENT work, uh, especially trauma surgery, things like that. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, then that goes hand in hand with, with the percutaneous dilational tracheostomy from the unit. Uh, prediction of post extubation stride. I'm not real sure that we've got the time to uh, be doing ultrasound to, to go into this, but I'm pretty sure if you're predicting this, you're probably doing some uh, management, including some steroids, etc. And as well, uh, predicting the size of a left sided double lumen tube, I, I do a lot of double lumen tubes, and I'm not real sure that I'm going to have uh, much utility for this. Uh, but again, if you can get some bronchial measurements or at least some tracheal measurements, you have a good idea about how big a tube you can accommodate. And we got a couple of examples coming up here. And finally, we're going to evaluate um, the uh, epiglottis as well and, and some type of utility you know to again tool versus toy i'm not sure of of these uh eight or ten bullet points what you would consider to be part of your practice but uh you can never tell in five years some of the uses of airway ultrasound for difficult airway evaluation um a lot of these studies are in pilot mode or people have just been kind of playing around they don't really have the numbers they don't really have the outcome studies to support it but um, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years especially with the evolution of the handheld and the availability of, of ultrasound but uh, sublingual and transcutaneous approaches have both been used to visualize the upper airway uh, Hugh and Sue have, have done some work with sublingual uh, transducers and I'm not sure what transducers they used obviously it's a special transducer to go into the oropharynx but uh, sublingual approaches uses a deeper probe uh, with a little, bit, a little bit more depth than the, the typical linear probe uh, the epiglottis and laryngeal inlet are often poorly visualized due to acoustic shadowing uh, it's, it's kind of tough to see the hyoid bone but that would be uh, a very good predictor of DL going from submental to, to, to hyoid bone um, a more um, a more uh, highly used approach is the transcutaneous approach, as you can see on the right here, using a, a uh, uh, transducer um, where you get some transcutaneous scanning done from the mentum um, all the way down to the sup suprasternal notch. Uh, what you, you see here is uh, structures that are relevant to airway management can be examined by ultrasound, uh, usually just using a standard scan, but in this case you can use a, a good scan to, to estimate tongue size. Airway related structures that can be visualized by computed tomography can also reliably be identified by ultrasound. You typically can uh, visualize the airway from mid trachea with ultrasonography all the way to the tip of the chin and some pretty easy to follow steps. Um, the tracheal cartilage is seen in a longitudinal plane as a string of beads. That's longitudinal uh, is also described as a sagittal plane. But you can see here in figure one, uh, you've got a string of beads here uh, progressing from uh, uh, right to left. And uh, it's seen as an inverted U in the transverse plane, as you can see here in figure two. And then you have a, an air mucosal interface formed by reverberation, seen as artifacts on transverse and longitudinal planes. Um, you can also see uh, Cartilage, here is a nice view of the thyroid gland. Uh, you have a nice comet tail artifact here, just some reverberation very similar to what you see in pulmonary, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, now this sagittal uh, view here of tracheal cartilage, we'll get into when we start talking about the cricoid and uh, the thyroid cartilage, uh, specifically as we talk about the cricothyroid membrane. And this is kind of an up close view of what you get as you're scanning uh, cranially. You can start down here around the sternal notch and as you, as you scan cranially, just before you get to the cricoid cartilage, you'll run across the, of course here's trachea, here you'll run across the tracheal cartilage, which is right here, along with the air mucosal interface 
uh, see a little you see a little bit of the thyroid gland here as well uh, those of you that are used to doing a lot of ultrasound for your line placement uh, are probably pretty familiar with a lot of what we're going to see here especially as we start to get a little bit more cranial especially as we start to find uh, the esophagus the thyroid gland uh, as you go from sternal notch to, to the thyroid um, transversely which is um, uh, short axis if you're if you're used to doing a lot of trans thoracic echo but as we move cranially we see a series of tracheal rings um, and, and what you typically see is you see when you get up to the thyroid gland you see the isthmus of the thyroid and you see both lateral components of, of the thyroid it's a very important anatomical landmark and can be seen on either side of the trachea um, obviously if you're uh, wanting to do a tracheostomy you're going to probably want to find the thyroid and delineate these structures before you start sticking needles in people. Uh, both the lobes and the isthmus can be seen. It's a, a very nice, easy to find structure. If you're looking for the cricothyroid membrane, you often use the sagittal or longitudinal plane, as you can see here. Uh, very easy to find. You typically find the string of pearls. Then you can easily find the cricoid membrane and the thyroid membrane. And the cricothyroid is a, a little structure in between. But in the longitudinal plane, the very hypoechoic appearance of the cricoid cartilage is seen as a bump or a hump here uh, here it's outlined in in um, in red but over here you can kind of see that it's very hypoechoic uh, the cricoid membranes illustrated in in green the air mucosal interface in blue over here um, and trying to give you a good idea about what the cricothyroid looks like uh, in short in sagittal view in the transverse plane uh, cricoid cartilage is seen as an oval hypoechoic hypoechoic structure here there's a, the cricoid cartilage and you there's this air uh, mucosal interface here just below it in some reverberation artifact Tracheal cartilage in the transverse plane is viewed as an inverted U-shaped structure bordered posteriorly by a hyperechoic undeviating strip line, the air mucosal interface. In, in this uh, particular view, we're looking at the cricoid cartilage, which is best seen as we move uh, cranially. It's shown sonographically as a C-shaped uh, mixed echoic structure, much thicker than the tracheal cartilages with a similar hyperechoic strip line of air mucosal interface directly beneath it. The cricothyroid membrane uh, should be seen a little bit further down, but you see this same uh, comet tail strip here, which is very familiar, uh, looks very much like the, the tracheal cartilage. The cricothyroid membrane is seen on the transverse view as a hyperechoic strip line sandwiched between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage. And what you can kind of see here is uh, you're starting to start to see a little bit of the uh, uh, thyroid cartilage right here. You see a little bit of a, uh, a reverberation artifact here. Um, going from the sternal notch to the thyroid cartilage, you can see uh, the thyroid cartilage is a nice big uh, upside down V-shaped structure um, and uh, it, it is, uh, uh, has a trachea here and typically when you get to the thyroid cartilage, you're going to start running across the vocal cords. If you're assessing the vocal cords, the vocal cords are best seen using a transverse plane um, through the thyroid cartilage as a window. And here, here is this uh, thyroid cartilage here designated as TC. Uh, as well, you can start to see the cords here, uh, the medial and the, the lateral cords, the retinoid cartilage is down here. Uh, my scans never really <laughs> look this good, as you'll notice momentarily. Uh, this is during abduction, uh, during phonation, and and this is going to be during adduction uh, or when you've got your cords closed. And the hyperechoic appearance of the vocal ligaments delineates the vocal cords, the vocal ligaments here uh, and here. 
Uh, transverse view of the vocal cords. You can see moving your, your, your probe up cranially. Uh, here's your, your vocal membrane, vocal muscle, and I really did not get a very good look. Uh, I, I was saying a few words while I was talking here, but you see the thyroid cartilage here and then vocal cords here, and there's, uh, I, I didn't, here's a little bit of a retinoid uh, down here, and that's about the best I could do. If you're assessing for the esophagus, um, again, my uh, a previous picture had a, a nice picture of the double lumen uh, uh, endotracheal tube, which is there. It's not a double lumen tube, but that's kind of the, the appearance that it has. But typically, you've got the thyroid and you've got an esophagus uh, on the left side of, of the trachea. Uh, here, they've got the typical scan where the, the orientation marker is on the right, so your esophagus is over here. Uh, here, I, I switched it to the correct orientation. You have the thyroid gland over here, and you have the esophagus here. And you can see when I start to swallow, um, it kind of has a nice little jump to it. Uh, and then the trachea is here, and you got a little bit of of, uh, of a cricoid cartilage right up here between the tracheal and cricoid cartilage. Well, a couple of the really high utility uses for airway ultrasound um, is typically trying to assess the subglottic airway, especially in, in children, as you know, uh, the, the the glottic opening is not necessarily the most narrow portion of, of the child's airway. Uh, it is actually the subglottic region. And there was all the discussion and fight and, and uh, everything about uh, whether or not to be using an endotracheal tube cuff in children. Now we're all pretty much using it, but uh, at, at least uh, I guess it's a regional or a cultural uh, um, decision. But here you are, are making a very nice little estimation of the child's uh, tube size. Here you've got 0.62, which is the uh, outside diameter of the endotracheal tube, which is, I don't know, probably a four and a half. Uh, but you can see here that you're measuring basically between the subglottic uh, transverse diameter uh, on either side and, and getting this nice little measurement here. You can do this with your butterfly. Um, I've got an, uh, an example in just a moment I use with, with my sonocyte. Uh, I've got no conflicts of interest, by the way. I'm, I don't work for Sonosite. Uh It's just the device that I've got uh, related to my practice. An interesting use for um, uh, uh, airway ultrasound, it comes when you're trying to evaluate recurrent laryngeal nerve damage, of course. Um, and uh, one of those these uses is I, I typically go in a sagittal plane or longitudinal plane uh, just to the left or right of the vocal cords. And you can see here I, I did a little check on my wife. And you see the letter E being said with her vocal cords. So obviously she's doing well with that. And I'm not sure if you can't get the same degree of utility uh, out of just saying the letter E, but I think that you can actually... Uh, discriminate between left or right recurrent laryngeal nerve damage damage with this technique. Um, and here on, the, on this right panel, you can see where I actually measured the subglottic diameter and calculating an, an, ex, an outer diameter on an endotracheal tube of 1.14 centimeters, which correlates with a, about an eight and a half endotracheal tube. My wife was very pleased to know that she could accommodate an eight and a half tube. Uh, airway ultrasound, can be used uh, as we spoke before for ruling out recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. The incidence following uh, thyroidectomy is about 1.4 to 5.1%, and you can see you can get a, a pretty good bit of of, of uh, movement here on this on this left side. Not a lot of movement over here on this right side. Um, usually, it's noticed post-op, and monitoring techniques include NIMS tubes, uh, fiber optic bronch post-op in some some uh, practices. Vocal cord ultrasound, again, is a viable option in assessing recurrent laryngeal nerve injury in about 90% of females, but in men, it's only it drops to about 50%. So it's not really something that you can hang your hat on. So this is a very good use um, 
of ultrasound. It's probably one of the top one or two utilities. And over here on the left panel, you can kind of see as you slide forward in the sagittal view, you got your cricoid cartilage over here, uh, thyroid cartilage that you can't really see too well, but you've got your cricothyroid membrane. Uh, you can see your cricoid cartilage in your CTM here. And then as you slide, um, uh, cranially, you can kind of see there's my cricoid cartilage over here, and I've actually taken a little bobby pin or a little uh, paper clip, and I'm going to slide it up here and identify the cricothyroid membrane. And actually, you can put a little uh, sharpie or something and mark it. You can also verify uh, endotracheal tube intubation. Uh, here, the uh, tracheal is visualized. And you can also notice the double track sign, which is uh, demonstrating in the tracheal tube. Uh, you can also get the uh, uh, sagittal view over here in the right panel. So you get longitudinal and transverse planes. And the esophagus should be visualized as well. Uh, and if that's the case, then you're able to verify that it's not in the esophagus. And it's often complemented by a pulmonary scan demonstrating sliding. Uh, some people like to use lung pulse, um, but sliding is so much quicker. And we'll talk about that uh, and the utility of that in just a moment. And the moment has passed. We're going to verify tracheal intubation, um, which you may or may not have heard about. You have the left lung over here on the left. You've got a rib. And here is the visceral and parietal pleura. You don't really have any sliding here, any movement, but you do see a pulsation uh, with, with heart rate. And then over here on the right side, you've got a rib, and you've got some nice sliding up and down the visceral and parietal pleura, which is a nice indication uh, that you do have, uh, uh, in this case, <laughs> a right mainstem intubation. A very nice um, high utility scan that you can get from, from your POCUS is the uh, gastric ultrasound in an aspiration uh, risk assessment. Basically, you can evaluate if the stomach's empty or possesses gastric content that poses an aspiration risk. And of course, aspiration is a leading cause of death from anesthesia airway events. Um, an accurate risk assessment is often a root cause uh, of aspiration events. If you've been an expert witness or been deposed before, uh, this is something that, um, you know, the, the whole full stomach or not full stomach is a big deal. Um, there was a very good movie from, from the 50s where actually the uh, the nurse documented that the patient was had just got through eating and uh, she was kind of silenced and then when it came out it was a big lawsuit etc cetera, etc cetera. I guess you you have to watch old movies to appreciate that um, gastric ultrasound is an emerging point of care tool that provides bedside information on gastric volume but also on gastric content based on some of the uh, artifacts that you see with the with fluid versus solid foods Um, some of the fasting guidelines uh, based on uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists fasting recommendations, um, patients should be informed of fasting requirements and the physical exam should be performed at, at some point. It's one of the, the, the first three questions I ask somebody is, is how was their, their dinner their, or their breakfast this morning. Uh, along with the history, examination, and interview consideration should include uh, age, uh, what type of surgery they're having done, what their ASA status is, also their potential for a difficult airway. You start messing around in the airway, uh, then you end up having the uh, amateur hour where you have food in the lungs and air in the stomach. Um, also uh, potential for GERD, um, and you also have the potential for dysphagia, GI motility issues uh, that are usually associated with, with metabolic or disorders such as, as diabetes. And also you're going to compare the risk and benefits of proceeding based on what your uh, assessment was. And a lot of these fasting um, assessments are based on uh, time. If you have clear liquids, you have a minimum fasting period of two hours. Um, and then breast milk, four hours. Infant formula, six hours if you're into uh, a pediatric practice. Non-human milk, uh, six hours. And if you're talking about light milk, it's still six hours. And then if you're talking about the typical dinner uh, from the deep south, fried foods, fatty foods, meat products, you're talking about at least eight hours, if not more. And this is something that's a, um, these are the, the guidelines. But again, uh, the ASA is not giving you a, a break here at all. You should be at least eight hours, if not more, in 
uh, deciding whether or not the risk is uh, going to be worse than the benefits. Gastric scanning typically uses a curved array, low frequency abdominal probe with abdominal presets. If you've got a, a, a butterfly or lumify uh, or a, a V scan or whatever your handheld might be, they've got very nice uh, abdominal presets for this. Um, stomach's imaged in the epigastric area, immediately inferior to the xiphoid and superior to the umbilicus. If you are doing a uh, IVC scan, for example, and trying to find volume status or determine volume status, often you run across the stomach. It's, it's that close to the IVC. Um, and uh, typically you're going to be uh, on your right side, right lateral decubitus. And uh, if you're supine, you're not really going to get good separation. You might end up getting the pylorus. So typically it's right lateral decubitus as you can see here um, in this panel on the right. Transducers swept from the left to the right subcostal margin. You have a gentle sliding rotation and tilting of the probe to locate the antrum and optimize the image. And typically, uh, optimal image is going to have the left side of the liver over here. You're going to have the antrum of the stomach. You're going to have uh, the aorta down here. Uh, SMA may or may, may not be that easy to visualize depending on the uh, body habitus of the patients you're taking care of. And then oblique views from the excessive probe rotation could overestimate the antral size. So if you don't have a, a really good um, alignment of all these different structures, aorta and uh, tip of the liver, pancreas, antrum of the stomach, you can e easily overestimate or underestimate. As well, you can be looking at the pylorus instead of the antrum, which is going to be a completely different uh, set of variables. So uh, in assessing gastric volume and content, uh, you can have empty, clear liquid, thick fluid, or solid. That can be established based on qualitative findings. With the stomachs empty, the antrum is either flat or round with the juxtaposed anterior and posterior walls, um, like a bullseye. Um, sometimes the volume can be solid or liquid. If it's solid, you got a frosted glass appearance because uh, of acoustic shadowing uh, and some of the artifacts that come along with ultrasound imaging. If it's liquid, it's pretty homogeneous, almost hypoechoic or anechoic, and often it's like a starry notch. You got little specks in there, a little bit of air that that comes along with, with part of, of peristalsis. Um, Dr. Perlis did a very good job with her group out, out of Toronto. She did a, a definitive work. She also did a definitive uh, study, as we'll talk about momentarily, about how to, to estimate gastric volume and trying to enhance your decision making. Gastric focus in decision making is used to stratify individual risk for aspiration and tailor airway and anesthetic measure, uh, management. Uh, empty stomach or a low volume of clear fluid within the range of baseline gastric secretions is consistent with a fasting state and suggests a low risk. And if you follow this algorithm, you have your qualitative exam. And if you have a empty grade zero antrum, then you are probably pretty much good to go. You have a very low risk given everything else is the same. Um, again, there is operator error. You probably need to be following the ASA guidelines. I understand there's a lot of discussion about um, which guideline to follow, whether it's ultrasound guidelines or whether it's, it's a time type thing versus a type of, of, of volume. Uh, that's something that's up to the individual provider. But to be honest, I'm going to go the, the safest route. And so are you, I'm sure. Uh, other qualitative exams, if it's clear fluid, then you're pretty much calculating the volume based on what you get with the measurements, which we'll talk about in a moment. Solid food, uh, no matter what the volume says, it's going to be high risk. And solid is pretty much something that you pick up from uh, from the acoustic shadowing, the frosted glass look. Uh, then there's grade one versus grade two, um, uh, risk making, low risk versus high risk. And grade two is one and a half cc's per kilo. Um, and this is something, again, that is I'm telling you that's going to be something that's entirely up to you. So this is a, a, a scan um, of an empty stomach. Uh, this is actually my wife's. And you can see here you've got a nice view of the left lobe of the liver, uh, aorta here, IVC. You've got the bullseye here in the middle. You've got a little view of the SMA here. Um, and she's slightly head up between 25 to 45 degrees positioned in the right lateral acuitous position. 
I'm imaging this in a parasagittal position, which is basically not longitudinal and it's not transverse. It's pretty much just uh, between the two. And again, we talked about the different landmarks. And the idea here is you get the smallest cross-sectional view of the antrum if you're trying to measure it. As we said before, the gastric antrum measurement is made by uh, findings uh, the smallest possible cross-section view. Um, typically, the anteroposterior and craniocaudal diameters are measured to calculate the cross-sectional areas. So you can see in this, um, uh, in, this is the same view that you just saw. Uh, you've got uh, the left lobe of the liver, you've got the bullseye, you've got the aorta here, so you've got probably the best cross-sectional area that you can get. And I just put an area tool on for my butterfly just just to uh, to compare, and I got 3.24 centimeters. Um, I can also take the anteroposterior diameter and the craniocaudal diameter, multiply it times pi, and then divide by four. Any CSA that's uh, less than four centimeters squared corresponds to an empty stomach, and looks like today uh, or this particular day, Ellen's stomach was uh, indeed empty. Um, and I, I got her to fill it up, as we'll see in just a moment, <laughs> which is uh, was a unique adventure. Area tools are very convenient and improves process and flow, but is not very scientific or accurate. But at the same time, those of us that are in very busy practices, uh, we are often not necessarily cutting corners, but we're using the fastest processing capability that we can think of. So this is um, Ellen's stomach after eight ounces of coffee. And uh, you can see I've got a... Uh, uh, bullseye over here and I've got the aorta I've got the IVC and I've got my liver over here on the fluid filled stomach here's the liver tip uh, pancreas is down here there's some uh, the starry night stomach that's associated with eight ounces of coffee uh, got a nice aorta here uh, you can see a little bit of a touch of the SMA in this particular view um, and so we'll the, I guess the thing to do here is to qualify it say hey you know what it doesn't look very full it looks starry night uh, what's your MPO time and what have you had to drink uh, and move along from there so if you're measuring the uh, volume in the stomach which is something that is very important um, and Perlis has done again some very good work here and done the definitive work on it Typically, a cross-sectional area of 10 centimeters squared or more corresponds to a gastric volume between 100 and 240 cc's. That's a pretty good bit of volume. And so if you've got, um, if you're taking the area tool on my butterfly, I'm getting 8.01 centimeters squared. If I'm getting the the AA and the and the the other uh, dimension here, cranial caudal, uh, and then multiplying it times pi and dividing by four, I'm going to come up with pretty much the same uh, circumfer circumferential area or, or cross-sectional area. Uh, again, clear fluids appear hypoechoic, and you, you can use the, the, the uh, area tool on your, your handheld. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it wouldn't work very well in the court of law. Dr. Perlis would probably come up and testify against you. In this scan, uh, you've got uh, the empty stomach again uh, on the left side, and you've got a nice bullseye uh, on the right. This is after a taco. <laughs> Sorry, it's all we had in the house. And there's the liver, tip the liver. Here's the aorta over here, which is kind of poorly uh, delineated. And you can see the frosted glass appearance here, and you think, well, that's not very good at all. You have to be very careful uh, in not looking at the bowel at looking at bowel here and stomach over here, that can be easily confused and then your decision making is, is completely flawed. So a lot of this has to do with lining up your aorta and everything in the correct plane. So if you're going to calculate the, the volume of a single soft shell taco, um, obviously my uh, using my handheld, my cross-sectional area was about 12 centimeters squared, uh, and using the different measurements, uh, it was pretty close to that. Uh, this again is the frosted glass appearance, uh, and this frosted glass appearance is, is typically due to air mixed with solid food during the swallowing process. And a big part of this is getting them off their back and putting them on the right side, uh, so it makes the measurement much more sensitive. So let's talk uh, about lung point of care ultrasound scanning and interpretation. 
Just a few of, of the uh, definitions. Long sliding is the artifact of visceral pleura moving against parietal pleura with respiration. You don't see it with pneumothorax, and you don't see it with, with right endobronchial intubation. Uh, a lines are caused by reverberation between the transducer surface and the parietal pleura, which is very normal, um, as opposed to B lines, which are abnormal because they're caused by reverberation in the alveoli or interstitium that are filled with fluid or junk. And some people call this lung rockets, comets, whatever you want to call it, but it indicates abnormal extravascular lung fluid or interstitial fibrosis. And not to panic, we're going to get into some, uh, some examples of this in just a moment uh, using the simulator. Pleural effusions are very hypoechoic areas appearing between the diaphragm and the lung. You have pleural effusions in ascites that may build up with failure of the heart, kidneys, and or liver. And consolidation looks a lot like liver. Uh, it, it doesn't really have that starring out appearance. It doesn't look very anechoic. Um, and, and in general, when you're scanning the lung, you're not, it's kind of tough to scan air. Air doesn't really reflect, reflect a lot, but you are able to use artifacts and reverberations and uh, things like that in, in making this decision, especially when you start talking about um, plural scanning uh, using the FAST exam. Some of the lung ultrasound imaging strategies, you have four chest areas per side for a complete eight zone one scan. Areas one and two denote the upper and lower anterior chest wall area. Um, and then the area three and four denote the upper lateral and basal lateral chest areas. The parasternal line is the border for areas one and two, as you can see here. And then the anterior axillary line is the border between areas one and three and two and four. Then the posterior axillary line marks the border for areas three and four and the beginning of the posterior chest, which uh, really, if you're starting to get into the uh, posterior chest, you're really starting to do some some really big time lung ultrasound and and more along the lines of some type of, of uh, diagnostic imaging outside the realm of POCUS. So practical lung ultrasound. Uh, lung ultrasound relies not only on the direct visualization, but also interpretation of lung artifacts, as we said before. Um, if you look at, at the scan, you can see the transducer. This is the near field here. It's sending images out, and you're getting images back based on, uh, on the acoustic impedance of the different tissues. So here's just the normal reverberation, some normal A lines. You get that sliding we talked about along the pleural line, um, and you get the rib shadow uh, because you, you're using a uh, curvilinear transducer. Uh, through this scan, you can pick up pneumothorax. You don't have the sliding. Pleural effusion, you start to have some anechoic areas. Consolidation, um, the, the lung starts to look more like a gland instead of an airfield structure. Uh, and pulmonary edema or interstitial disease, uh, as evidenced by, by B lines. Curvilinear is considered the best all around probe, but the phased array is also used. I'm a, a a cardiothoracic person. I, I'm cardiovascular ultrasound certified and I've been using the phased array a lot so it's kind of hard to break <laughs> the phased array habit but the curvilinear is very useful for, for lung ultrasound uh, especially if you're doing some components of the FAST as well. The, the focus assess sonography for trauma. Um, a comprehensive point of care ultrasound or POCUS scan can be done in about five minutes um, using this technique. For, uh, for the lungs. And you have better diagnostic capabilities than the physical exam and the chest x-ray combined. So lung ultrasound, if you're doing this in the ER, you need to be doing some lung ultrasound. So in this um, uh, superior lung scan, uh, you can see uh, your scan is between the second and third rib, about midclavicular, and you see you've got some sliding here, which means you do not have a pneumothorax. You've got some nice discrete A-lines, uh, which means that you don't really have much fluid uh, in, in your lungs. Um, and um, other, other issues that you might see, you don't see any consolidation, any anechoic regions in, in the lung as well. But the ultrasound waves are, are able to travel between the probe and the pleura, and you see A lines at equidistant horizontal lines in this scan. B lines are a little bit on the different side. B lines are reverberations caused by resonance phenomena. So in the same uh, 
uh, scan from the second, third intercostal space, you can see you don't have any A lines. Instead, you've got B lines, which means uh, these these uh, uh, sound waves are passing through fluid-filled or uh, or some type of gunky alveoli. And this is associated with increased lung weight, atelectasis, and typically a curvilinear or, or phased array probe with a depth of about of greater than 15 centimeters is what you're using. I'm using a phased array in this particular simulator. Uh, these are also known as lung rockets or comet tails. And they arise from the plural line, uh, which is right here, and they extend all the way to the bottom of the screen. This is a right intercostal scan, uh, two-dimensional. I uh, point that out, 2D or B mode or brightness mode is different than M mode, which is very useful in the pneumothorax, which we'll be looking at momentarily. Uh, and we'll be talking about the difference between the two of those in a moment. But you have a normal scan on the left here where you've got sliding along the uh, the the plural line, uh, parietal plural here, visceral plural over here. You've got some nice A lines here. And over here on the right, you notice that I've got no real sliding at all. Uh, nothing's really moving. Don't really have much of a long pulse to, to, to see, but there's no sliding. I'm saying that the patient's got a pneumothorax on the affected side. Um, let's compare uh, B lines and long sliding. Uh, you can see in this uh, two-dimensional image over here on the left. You've got the sliding. You've got rib shadow. The rib shadow is over here. There's your plural line, which is very important to notice the thickness, especially if you're talking about some COVID-19 patients. B lines are here between the rib shadows. Um, and then you've got this patient with a pneumothorax here. Actually, uh, this is a nice little lung point. You can see some sliding over here, but no sliding over here on this side of the rib. So this is uh, pretty much definitive for a pneumothorax. This is a uh, M mode. You have two dimensional here, and, and then you've got the M mode down here. This is taking a slice right through this two dimensional image, and then what you're seeing is you're seeing the the uh, parietal pleura here as the ocean, and then you're seeing the pleura line here as the coastline, and then you're seeing this sandy beach here, which is the visceral. And so you can kind of see because the lung is moving, you've got speckled appearance of, of the visceral pleura. And this is uh, two scans, the patient on the left. This is a two-dimensional image of somebody that's normal. And you've got that same ocean, pleura line, and sandy beach or visceral pleura. Over here on the right side, uh, you've got a different scan. You've got the 2D image but you've got ocean, you've got the water line, and then you've got barcode because none of this is moving. So it's all pretty much just a solid line. And this is pretty definitive for uh, making a diagnosis of pneumothorax. If you're diagnosing acute respiratory failure, lung ultrasound is, is very key because you're able to evaluate four basic assessments. You're looking at lung artifacts, like we talked about, A and B lines, uh, lung sliding, alveolar consolidation, um, and pleural effusion. Uh, Lichtenstein and his group came up with something called the BLUE protocol. And the BLUE protocol, you're looking at anterior lung sliding, and we've looked at the anterior lung in a previous scan. You're assessing for B lines, you're assessing for alveolar consolidation, and you're assessing for posterior lateral or pleural effusion. Um, so what he start at, starts out at with the BLUE protocol is you start out by looking at lung sliding, you examine upper and lower blue points for lung sliding, then you look for anterior A or B lines. And and if you've got B lines, you could have pulmonary edema. Uh, A lines, you're starting to look for some type of DVT, and you're looking at uh, some type of, of, of long point uh, as well. If you're looking for sliding and you've got no sliding at all, then you're looking for B lines and A lines. And if, they're, uh, if you've got them, then you're looking uh, for a diagnosis of pneumonia. If you've got A lines and you've got a lung point, which means like what we saw earlier where you've got sliding versus no sliding, you probably have a, you have a pretty much a definite diagnosis of, of pneumothorax. Lung point is very difficult to find, by the way. If you're, if you're looking to think, well, I'll just go straight and try to find the lung point, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to find. And to be honest, I don't have the patience for it. 
So this is a normal lung versus a patient with alveolar consolidation. You can see that I've got sliding. I've got some nice A lines here uh, on this patient. I've got some sliding and I've got some nice A lines or some A lines here, but I've got a lot of consolidation over here on the right. Uh, and you've got uh, junky stuff here. You're starting to get some ultrasound that, uh, waves that are bouncing off. It's starting to look more like a solid organ. This is what you see uh, with pneumonia. If you're looking at a pleural effusion, uh, this is a, a, what you may see in a, in a, a right basal pleural view or a right upper quadrant view. You're sticking your probe uh, about the ninth or 10th intercostal space. And so you see the diaphragm here and you've got a little bit of lung and you get something called a mirror artifact. If you've got air here, pretty much uh, the sound wave is going to bounce off the diaphragm, hit the liver, go back to the lung, and then go all the way back up to your transducer. So you're going to have a nice mirror artifact. It looks just like liver over in the chest, but it's not. Then you have the curtain effect of the, of the, uh, the, of the lung going in and out. Um, if you've got a pleural effusion, as you do over here on the right panel, you've got the curtain, but you've got an anechoic region here, and you don't really have a very good mirror artifact. Uh, you, it's kind of patchy, but you can see that you've got in this base here, you've got a pretty nice big effusion. Liver over here, liver over here. So uh, there are some indications and limitations of pulmonary assessment. Some of the indications are hypoxemia, low saturation, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, and you suspect pneumothorax, hemothorax, pleural effusion, pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and ARDS. So let's face it, I mean, we don't necessarily work in the ER uh, and are not pulling our probe out and doing assessments on patients. If we wanted to talk to our patients, we would have gone into internal medicine, right? So basically, though, this is somebody that coming to your, to your uh, OR, to your holding area, uh, and you're trying to, to rule out pulmonary edema versus pneumothorax. This is somebody, if you're in a big trauma service, uh, the facility I work at, we have a very large trauma service, and this is kind of what would be uh, have a high utility item for us. There are limitations in pulmonary ultrasound, just like in all ultrasound, and that's the inability to acquire high quality images, especially when you first start scanning. Uh, this is not something where you can just pick up a, a probe after seeing a, a voiceover PowerPoint or a video and get the scanning. Resolution and image interpretation is another big limitation, uh, uh, especially in large people. Um, and interpreting the image as well is, is tough. It's, it's something that you just got to get in and, and look at some different scans online, I recommend. Um, multiple images, multiple transducers at some time, uh, multiple sites, multiple positions, and multiple modes. I mean, this is uh, something that is uh, got a pretty steep learning curve. And then once, once you get up there, uh, it really is a very nice tool. So just a couple of views, uh, right in the costal view, you're going to do a nice pencil grip. Orientation marker is going to be towards the head. Midclavicular, second to third intercostal space. You're looking for a pneumothorax and pulmonary edema. Landmarks are the ribs, lung, and the pleural line between the two ribs. And you're looking for some specific things. You're looking for uh, lung or pleural sliding, and you're looking for B lines out of the ordinary. Uh, right under costal scan key points, the normal A lines are reverberation artifacts from the visceral and parietal pleura, and B lines, anything over three B lines are found with fluid in the alveoli and pulmonary edema. You can have comet tail, rocket lines, whatever you want to call them. Pneumos diagnosed with lung sliding versus non-lung sliding. Typically, you're going from 2 mode, uh, 2D mode to M mode, and you're assessing beach versus barcode. Um, evaluation for hemothorax, including right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant views. Normal scan, again, you've got the nice uh, sliding going on here, parietal and visceral pleura. You've got nice A lines. In the right intercostal scan for uh, pneumothorax, however, you've got as you can see here, you get the lung curtain and you've got uh, a lung point here and you get no sliding whatsoever. That's a very good sign of having a uh, pneumothorax. If you, if you can't find the lung point, you probably have a pneumothorax. If you find the lung point, you definitely have a pneumothorax. 
Again, you got the uh, dropout from the rib here. Uh, and as you can see on this diagram on the left, you can kind of see where the plural uh, space is and the lung is. So this is a real-time right intercostal scan with pneumothorax. Uh, this is an M-mode. And what you see is uh, you've got some nice sliding here in a normal patient. You've got some nice A-lines dropped out from the ribs. And then in this patient, you've got a pneumothorax. So you've got the barcode. You've got the coastal line. You've got the, the, the parietal pleura, visceral pleura. Now we've gone back to ventilating with a 2D mode, and you can see these, the sandy beach appearance, which is a, a very nice um, uh, way of distinguishing between pneumothorax and no pneumothorax. This is a patient with a uh, right intercostal scan with pulmonary edema. You can see the where the ribs are. Uh, I'm actually between the ribs. I'm with a phased array probe I cheated. And you've got a nice uh, pleural line here, and you can see the rocket lines. And there's more than three. If you, if you watch across the scan, there's probably six, which tells you that you've got some pulmonary edema or some type of interstitial problem. This is a right pleural scan, and you can kind of see from the uh, 3D image on the left side, uh, right side, uh, ninth or 10th intercostal space. And what I'm getting is I'm getting uh, diaphragm here, liver. I've got the curtain coming across here, and I've got a nice uh, mirror artifact. It looks a lot like the liver over here, as you can tell. If you're thinking, well, that's consolidation. Well, it really looks a lot like the liver. And I don't think the simulator here did a very good justice. Uh, this is where if you get some, some, some chance to scan with some normal uh, patients, it really helps you when you start to look at patients with abnormal presentations. This is a right pleural scan, uh, normal versus a mild pleural effusion. You can see the uh, curtain effect over here. You can see a little bit of a mirror artifact, liver, diaphragm. And then this is a patient that's got a little bit of an effusion over here, and it's showing up in the pleural space. You still have some uh, mirror artifact over here, but you definitely have this anechoic region here right above the diaphragm in the subphrenic space. This is a patient with a moderate, moderate pleural effusion. You can see the normal patient over here on the left that you've seen a couple of times already. Over here on the right, you've got effusion. You've got an anechoic region that goes all the way uh, up here to the point where you have very little, if any, mirror artifact. You can see some lung here, liver, uh, diaphragm moving, uh, but you're calling this a moderate effusion. You can measure this, but uh, pretty much this is a, a, a qualitative assessment. This is a patient with a severe pleural effusion. You see on this patient here on the left, you see you've got the curtain and you've got the liver, you've got mirroring artifact, no real, real effusion over here, but over here you've got a nice big section of anechoic effusion, almost getting a little bit of starry night consolidation or something to that effect. So there's no mirror artifact at all. And I'm, I'm basing this severe versus moderate based extremely non-qualitative because a lot of this has to do with getting your probe in just the right position uh, between the ribs if you're using a, um, a curvilinear probe. And this is a scan from the left side, the left pleural space. And what you've got is you've got the 3D image over here. You're between the ninth and 10th space. Uh, spleen's down here, spleen's over here. Um, and you can see the lung up here. You can see a nice big effusion. There's a diaphragm here. Again, this is a subphrenic uh, effusion. And typically, um, the uh, left side effusions, um, uh, you, often you can confuse those with some abdominal fluid. Because if you're going to get some uh, abdominal free fluid, it's going to typically accumulate uh, around this area as well.
And this is a normal plural scan versus consolidation. You can see this is the same uh, plural scan with the diaphragm, the liver, versus the uh, lung over here, but you also get some consolidation. You can kind of see some swirling here, some mixing. Consolidation versus effusion, uh, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. This is almost like, a, like an effusion that's kind of gotten rank and nasty. So in this patient, we have car versus tree, and we are going to do a quick little pulmonary scan on him. Going anteriorly first, uh, you notice that instead of having nice A lines, he has a confluence of B lines. He obviously is a little bit of failure, pulmonary edema. Uh, he does have a history of NYHA class three. And going a little bit further, uh, post, uh, further uh, distally or further caudally, you see that we've got some, some nice ribs shadows here and we've got some consolidation. There's his diaphragm, there's his liver, and uh, obviously we've got a couple of things going on. If you're going into zone three, you're starting to see some more of these same B lines. There's some rib shadows here, but you do have some sliding, so you don't worry about having any pneumo. Uh, going even further down south, down to zone four, you're going to see uh, this patient has a pretty good bit of, of, of a Pleural effusion here. Here's pleural effusion. You've lost your, your mirroring artifact there as well. Going to the left chest, uh, you see that we've got no real sliding here. Uh, and despite moving the probe around, we've got no sliding. We're suspecting pneumo, so we put it a, in an M mode. Uh, and what we've got is we've got the, the, the seashore, and then we've got the uh, barcode instead of the sandy beach. So we've got a pneumothorax. So let's talk a little bit about the role of, of lung ultrasound in COVID-19 patients. Um, along with physical examination and chest x-ray uh, presentation, including fever, etc., uh, CT is a very big part of, of assessing and diagnosing COVID-19. You have thickened irregular pleura on CT, you have ground glass opacities, uh, or the, the crazy paved road appearance. You have pulmonary infiltrating shadow, subpleural and airspace consolidation, and some of the other uh, um, consequences or signs of COVID-19. Um, however, as we all know, CT is a little bit difficult to be loaded into. You suddenly have a, a patient that's on, on restriction and isolation. And, and, if, and if you're at, at the point of care, sometimes it's good to uh, just kind of stick a probe on. So ultrasound, you have the same thickening of the pleural lines with pleural line irregularity and some subpleural consolidation. You have multiple B lines in a variety of patterns. Um, and when they're really, really sick, they have some confluent uh, B lines. Rarely you have pleural effusions. It's just not really something that's part of the presentation, the ultrasound presentation of the COVID-19 patient. And then consolidations in a variety of patterns uh, occur, that, and often you have uh, uh, mobile air bronchograms. This is a scan, and, and uh, what you're seeing here is a patient that's a, a COVID-19 patient. They're just starting to get a little bit symptomatic. They're starting to get a little bit hot. And you can see they've got some B lines here uh, scattered throughout with some A lines, and you're starting to drop a few A lines, areas of absent A lines in this particular scan. And you can also see this plural line here uh, is, is kind of irregular compared to what we've seen in the past. And this is, this is a very nice module put on by a simulator uh, made by Intelligent Ultrasound Body Works Eve. Uh, again, I have no conflicts of interest. They just have a very nice simulator. Uh, and this particular module happens to be a COVID-19 module. Um, this is the same patient, and what you're looking at now is we're getting a little bit better, closer look at the pleural line scan, but we're also looking at the right base. Uh, there's some rib dropout here. Um, you're getting a few uh, extra B lines. I don't see an effusion in here as well. This is an upper anterior scan on a patient that's a little bit sicker. They're getting a little hot. They're about 101 degrees. Along with the breathlessness, they're starting to get a persistent dry cough and periods of agitation. Notice the B lines have gotten a lot worse. They're thicker. They're more confluent. The pleural line's really starting to get thick. Um, and I don't really see very many A lines at all. Um, and we'll go a little bit down further. This is the upper anterior scan. We're going to go down to the base. This is a right basal lateral scan, and what you see is you see that same thick pleural line. You're starting to get some B lines as well, um, and, and maybe uh, a little bit more um, confluent uh, B lines than we saw in the previous scan. This is the right basal lateral or right upper quadrant view, and 
here's like we saw with the with the plural effusion you see that there's not a plural effusion here necessarily it's kind of a bad scan i apologize but you see some very thick confluent b lines everything's getting really thick down at the base and you've got a little bit of, of sub plural consolidation up here there's a little bit of thickness uh, and this is uh, uh the same patient that we've we've seen earlier this is an upper anterior scan you've got uh, in a patient that's really uh, got a temp of 102.2. They've been intubated to provide support, very thick plural line, very thick uh, confluent B lines as well. You can see the rib shadow here. And we're going to get a couple more scans on this same patient. This is the right basal lateral uh, scan on this patient. You can kind of see along with the B lines, we've got some consolidation, uh, which has got some static bronchograms. It looks more like a like an organ or a gland than an, an air-filled lung. And this plural line, again, is very thick and irregular. This is a basal lateral scan. Uh, you've got some subplural consolidation up here. Uh, you've got some B lines. Uh, there is some lung in there somewhere, but it's it's kind of hard to see. So in summary, um, pulmonary ultrasound and gastric ultrasound, ultrasound and airway ultrasound, um, there's a lot of utility for airway ultrasound and cricothyroid membrane identification, especially if you're anticipating a difficult airway and some type of advanced airway technique, including a cric or some type of tracheostomy. As well, trachea size estimation is a very big part of, of airway ultrasound. I think in the future, when we get some better techniques and uh, do, do uh, some more definitive studies, I think we'll have a better idea about some of the uses in uh, uh, categorizing airway difficulty. Uh, potential exists for endotracheal and endobronchial intubation verification, um, but I think it kind of slows down the process. Um, but the difficult airway assessment part, I believe, is something that's that's coming uh, in the near future. Gastric volume assessment has tremendous potential in identifying patients at risk for aspiration. We've got some nice formulas out there. We've also got some very nice qualitative assessments that give us a better idea about the patient's risk versus benefit. Uh, and finally, pulmonary ultrasound offers a point of care ultrasound capable of identifying patients with a pneumothorax. Also, uh, pleural effusion, uh, consolidation, pneumonia, uh, several different ways of assessing your patient's ability, uh, not necessarily to keep their oxygen saturation up uh, intraop, which is always very nice to know, but also to identify patients at risk for some type of, of pulmonary complications in the PACU, uh, especially given all the other variables, including patient status, uh, procedure uh, along with other types of comorbidities. So I'm John Shields. Thank you very much for coming along for this presentation over airway, gastric, and pulmonary ultrasound. I have some references here on uh, focused airway ultrasound, on uh, ultrasound assessment of gastric volume, uh, along with a very nice practical approach to lung ultrasound if you haven't done a lot of, of, of scanning, and the relevance of lung ultrasound in the diagnosis of acute respiratory failure. Also have some nice online resources. There's some very nice uh, airway and gastric videos, along with some nice pulmonary videos. This very last link is actually a, uh, uh, a virtual simulator for scanning uh, for lung ultrasound. Thank you very much.